Hello, my name is Dr. Ali Baumgartner and I am the Paleontology Collections Manager here at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. As Paleontology Collections Manager, I am in charge of a lot of different collections. Geology, vertebrate paleontology, paleobotany, and invert paleontology. Today I'm going to be talking about some of the unappreciated invertebrates of the Western Interior Seaway. If you're familiar with the Western Interior Seaway, congratulations, it's pretty much the coolest. But you're probably you're first thinking about vertebrates. And that makes sense. They're very charismatic and pretty famous. The Western Interior Seaway covered what is now Kansas during the end of the Cretaceous or throughout most of the Cretaceous. And so it's this, basically this interior sea, a shallow sea. It was warm, it was pretty shallow, and it was teeming with life. If you're looking at the vertebrates, it's basically all the cool stuff, right? You've got your enormous mosasaurs. You've got your amazing plesiosaurs. So multiple types of marine reptiles. You've also got some of the largest sea turtles that have ever lived. Um, you have enormous sharks and huge bony fish. Like it was kind of a terrifying time to be in the ocean. But in addition to that, it's easy to gloss over all of the other things that were living there that might not have had the big pointy teeth. Turtles don't have teeth, but you get what I'm saying. So I'm gonna show off some of my favorite things that you can find in the Western Interior Seaway that are not vertebrates. First, let's talk about Inoceramus. So Inoceramus was a huge clam. <laughs> and you may be saying, clam? That's not very exciting. No, 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 no. These were huge. <laughs> they're enormous. And they're not quite me-sized, but definitely bigger than your toddler. Like, if you're a child, this might be a little bit intimidating. And they're some of the most common fossils that we'll get in Western Kansas. When people bring in fossils to be identified, very frequently, it's little bits of Inoceramus. So we have some very beautiful complete ones up on exhibit if you want to you know, measure the size of your child against a big old clam. One of the really cool things about these fossil clams is like modern clams, they make pearls. So we have some fossil pearls in our collection and they're really, really cool. And they're pretty big, like there are, there are jawbreakers that are smaller than this pearl. And the really cool thing about it, the reason we know it is a pearl, sometimes we actually find them preserved, associated with Inoceramus, but you can see all of the different layers of how it formed. Because that's basically how a pearl forms. It's an irritation inside uh, the shell of the clam. And it basically like, that's annoying. I'm going to cover it up with uh, the, basically what makes up the inside of the, the shell. And so it has all of these layers that will grow, grow up over time. So we actually have... Uh, quite a few of these in our collection. One of my favorite things that ever happened was in like the first week that I worked here, I got an email from a jeweler who had gotten a fossil pearl and he contacted me because he thought that it looked like the pearl that we had in the magazine of pearls from the Sternbergs collection like 50 years ago, and he just wanted to make sure it wasn't stolen. So I went through our collection and was able to find the pearl that was in the magazine, no, we still have it. I really appreciated that uh, little interaction. So you can get fossil pearls. They're not particularly pretty, but they're definitely old and they're really cool. Another underdog friend that we have in the Western Interior Seaway are crinoids. So you might actually be familiar with crinoids. They're still around today. They're often called sea lilies. Um, and they look kind of like, there's actually a Pokemon that's based on a crinoid. Um, but they basically look like, uh, kind of like a, 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 um, a harder stalked jellyfish or, yeah, they have these uh, balls at the top, like a calyx with little segments coming down. And so they use those to filter feed. And there's a couple different body forms that we'll have with crinoids. Um, so you'll have the stocked and the unstocked crinoids. So the stocked crinoids are basically relegated to the sea floor. They may be moving a little bit or they may have a hold fast and be stuck in place. 
almost like a, like a flower, almost like a plant. You'll have some that are more free floating. So that's like our friend Uintacrinus. Uintacrinus is very common from the Western Interior Seaway, um, and it's very common in our fossil collections. Uh, up on exhibit, we have an absolutely massive slab of Uintacrinus with hundreds of different individuals in it, and it is FHSM IP1. So our museum, Invertebrate Paleontology 1. It is the very first thing that we cataloged into our Invertebrate Paleontology collection, and with good reason. They're really cool looking. So like I said, they're free floating. And Uintacrinus socialis gives you an idea of kind of its lifestyle. These were social. They were living in colonies. That's why you'll get slabs with hundreds of crinoids in them. And that's not uncommon. Sometimes we find them isolated. Sometimes we find them in big groups. In some uh, different species, fortunately not even to crinus, but other types of crinoids that we'll find in the Mesozoic, they'll actually be attached to driftwood and kind of floating off of and uh, filter feeding off of these big logs that were floating in the ocean. So do love uh, Crinoids love you into crinus. They're, like I said, they're very common. Um, and all of these little segments will come apart um, if it's not preserved very rapidly, um, almost like the beads of a necklace coming apart. And so sometimes you'll find rocks that are what I call crinoid spaghettios or crinoid cheerios. It is basically just all of these little circles that made up the different segments of the arms spread out across a rock. In addition to that, you have some of my favorites. I say that a lot of things are my favorite, but I think this might actually be true. Um, ammonites. I love ammonites. So when we talk about ammonites, we often compare them to modern cuttlefish because they were mollusks, so related to squids and uh, an octopus, but with a hard shell on the outside. So this is one that was uh, found in the Western Interior Seaway. And they've got, this one's got some really nice texture to it. But what you'll find with a lot of these is it'll still have the nacre. So basically the mother of pearl. And if you look at it, it's so shiny. It can be purple or red or green when it reflects the light. Um, this can be made into jewelry. It's called amylite. I like it better on the fossil, but that's just me. Um, I think they're beautiful. I love ammonites. So they could vary in size from teeny tiny to maybe the size of like a quarter or a half dollar, all the way to, I wouldn't be able to get my arms all the way around them. And we have the whole range in the Western Interior Seaway. Love an ammonite, miss them desperately, wish I could have met one. And then finally, one of the weirdest things, <laughs> I think, from the Western Interior Seaway are the reefs. So when I talk to you about a reef, you probably think coral, because today the kinds of reefs that we have are coral reefs. But in the past, we weren't limited <laughs> by that. Other uh, types of invertebrates decided to give that reef lifestyle a try. And in the Cretaceous, in the Western Interior Seaway, we have rudest reefs. And what's a rudest, you may ask? It's a bivalve. It's basically an oyster that um, tried out <laughs> the coral body shape. So it still has the two valves. You have the big one on the bottom, basically looking a little bit like a, a waffle cone. And then it's got a teeny tiny <laughs> little lid on top. And they were also filter feeding. So you would have these reefs where they would build their bodies right next to each other. Yeah, and they would just bring in all of the little particles of food um, that were floating in the Western Interior Seaway. And unfortunately, they're gone at the end of the seaway. Um, I think they're really neat. I love showing them to people because um, you're probably familiar with a lot of these other things. You know what a clam is, you've heard of pearls. If you're familiar with fossils, crinoids are something you've probably come across, definitely ammonites, but rudis, they're the underdogs, we should talk about them more. They're really, really heavy though, so maybe that's why, because people don't want to have to deal with carrying them around. 
I hope you enjoyed this, giving uh, a little bit of love to the underdogs of the Western Interior Seaway. If you like what you saw, subscribe, and we'll be back in two weeks with another video. Bye. Thanks for joining us in a new way to museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. If you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.